Good morning, and um, thank you to all involved for inviting me all the way from South Africa. It's a great opportunity to share with you uh, research that we conducted a few years ago, but that is still relevant, especially considering the call for action, which I read with great interest. Um, so I'll be talking about that empirical data, Carthage, um, starting off uh, with just a background on the project that I'm um, discussing. Uh, it was uh, aimed at contributing to a better informed discussion of how to improve current institutional policies in African countries. We covered at least 40 or 50, depending on where people were working and what their nationalities were. Um, and we were aiming to support career development of these researchers by communicating, as I'm doing today, um, the findings and the recommendations that come from those findings. And we're particularly interested in the younger scientists, but we surveyed and studied with interviews also some of the more mid-career scientists and even older scientists. So we had three study components. The first one I will not be discussing today, that was a bibliometric analysis of um, output by African countries. If those of you are interested, it is in the Young Scientists in Africa book, also called uh, The Next Generation of African Scientists, which you can find um, for free online on African Minds. Then we had a web-based survey of um, about 5,000 respondents, starting off with about 100,000 email addresses that we sourced from Scopus, from Web of Science. So it was a large undertaking. Um, uh, and we followed up with in-depth interviews with scientists that were more on the younger side of the spectrum, so around 39 on average. The web-based survey was conducted by a, a structured questionnaire. And we I will only be focusing on a few of the questions that we covered in that questionnaire. There were 10 sections, and the in-depth interviews generated a huge amount of data as well. So again, very selectively looking at some of the issues I think dovetail well with the call for action that we just heard about this morning. Just to take note, so most of the uh, results that I will be presenting and the recommendations apply to young scientists, which we defined as 39 years of and older, uh, or younger, sorry, um, in Africa, African countries. Um, most, according to the survey, uh, are in the higher education sector in academia, where about three quarters hold the rank of either lecturer or senior lecturer. 65% only have a PhD, so about one third don't have a PhD yet. And the science domains, well, we find them having a PhD in the natural sciences mostly, followed by the health sciences and then the social sciences. A bit of a different um, representation than the other two age groups. So I will be comparing throughout this presentation where possible uh, the 40 to 50-year-olds and the older than 50s with our focus group for today, the 39 years or younger group. My point of departure, as I said, is the call for action. And um, the first set of results that I would just like to mention um, are about uh, the, the extent to which scientists, the young scientists, consider themselves to be successful in attaining certain goals or values that are expressed in the call for action. And these are to solve social and environmental problems, for example. So if we asked um, the respondents about these different values or outcomes of their research and the percentage that reported themselves as highly successful, we find that a relatively small percentage and 28% of the younger group um, said that they were successful, highly successful, we would say, in solving, of in, uh, solving environmental uh, or social problems. And it is very similar to the other age groups, but still the lowest. So it's something that I think we should take into account. Something else that I just want to highlight in this chart is that the smallest percentage in all three age groups that felt they were highly successful in influencing policy or decision makers. As that, that is the one value that we find has the smallest percentage, which I thought dovetailed very well and supports very well the expression in the call for action that we need to enhance the training of early career researchers with the aim of empowering them to effectively inform decision makers. This is where they are really struggling in Africa. The focus of the remainder of this presentation will then be arranged as follows. 
Um, I looked at the call for action and it's highlighting of empowering and equitably supporting early to mid-career researchers in resource-limited countries, which most, if not all, of the African countries we studied fall into. So I would try to focus then on that comparison, as I mentioned, between young African scientists and their older counterparts in these African countries in terms of their need for support and their need for empowerment. Then secondly, in the call for action, we find a concern about lack of opportunities for the same younger generation of researchers, especially in developing nations, again, dovetailing very well with our study that asks what are the major lack of opportunities, what are the major challenges that young scientists in Africa face. So one question that covered everything in a very general manner in terms of challenges, well, not everything, but what we thought would be the most important challenges, um, are the 10 listed here. And I will only focus in my presentation on the ones that were ranked by the 39 years and older um, as one, two, three, and four, and five. So for everybody and for the young scientists, Lack of research funding and specifically also lack of funding for research equipment in laboratories was the greatest challenge. Um, this was followed, interestingly, by a lack of training opportunities to develop professional skills and then lack of mentoring and support. The uh, lack of training to develop professional skills I've highlighted because, as you will see, that's ranked third by the young scientists, which is quite different from the ranking uh, of four and six for the older scientists. So it is something that we take into account when we, um, we need to take into account when we focus on young scientists specifically. And then if the time allows, I will also look at number five, which is the lack of mobility opportunities. So in terms of research funding, just basic... Um, data on the amount of funding received in the preceding years, the three years before the survey. If we just disaggregate by age very broadly, we find that even the median for the 39-year-olds is zero US dollars, and they obviously have um, received the smallest amount of funding, obviously, because we know that there is a very strong correlation between funding received and chronological and professional age. What in the Qualitative interviews did the young scientists um, tell us about what the problems are that also they engage, or they have to engage when they um, try to secure funding. The requirements of funders in terms of experience, in terms of qualifications. Um, writing quality proposals of, is very challenging, not just because they're inexperienced, because of language barriers. It's time consuming, a lot of time goes into that instead of doing research. So uh, there's uh, a, a, a high level of stress uh, also that is associated with writing these proposals. And it's incredibly sad sometimes to read through these transcripts to realize how much of their own personal um, income the scientists use um, if they are unsuccessful in their grant applications um, so that they can just continue their research. The call for action also mentioned that a skilled a workforce needs to be developed that can drive technological and scientific innovation. So my next slide would be around mentoring and um, skills development. And we asked how many, uh, we asked the respondents uh, which of the following types of skills and or topics of mentoring they have received. And it's interesting to see that the ones that haven't, the percentages here is never or rarely received the specific type of skill. Are those um, concerning fundraising, so it dovetails with the previous uh, topic, career decisions, where should I go what, where should I work? Should I go to academia? What are the options outside of academia? Attaining a position or a job, how do I uh, even find job opportunities? How do I navigate that? Introduction to research networks also highlighted. So as we can see there on the right-hand side, there's a relatively uh, smaller need for the more technical uh, issues the research methods, the techniques, etc., that are um, considered to be part of PhD training and even postdoc training. The, 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 the um, focus is much more, or the need for, uh, is much more for um, the um, left hand there, um, the fundraising, career decisions, etc. So, 
To understand this as background, one has to also take into account that many young African scientists tend to be first-generation academics. So they, they do ask us for, an, uh, for uh, more information on how university cultures work. They are not sure how the cultures of different universities as well work. What are the expectations and roles associated with their positions? They are inexperienced in teaching, but especially in writing journal articles. And as we heard, we do not like to focus that much on the publishing of journal articles, but unfortunately, it seems to be a train that doesn't want to stop by itself. So um, it's sort of a self-reinforcing um, research evaluation phenomenon that we keep on focusing on the output of our journal articles. And the young scientists are aware of that. They don't know where to publish. They don't know which journals to choose. They get rejected often. They don't know why. Um, so um, journal publication, what is a predatory journal? How do I understand what the difference is between a predatory journal and an acceptable journal? Is a local journal better than a an international one, and in what circumstances. And then they struggle very much to find suitable mentors. This is partly because of brain drain. There are, in some universities, few experienced lecturers left, the rest have left for other countries, and that leaves uh, very few mentors. Um, those that are left, according to the qualitative data, are not very encouraging. They're actually in competition with the younger ones. There's a high level of competition for funding and they are um, being perceived as um, suppressing the younger scientists. The younger scientists get given the larger teaching, um, uh, uh, teaching volumes and not given the opportunity to even go to conference, etc. So um, that's also a problem that was highlighted. So next on to mobility. 37% of the respondents younger than 40 had an opportunity already by the time they were surveyed to study and or work abroad in the three years preceding the survey. So that's quite a lot. Um, it's slightly lower than the, uh, than the older age group, which was around 40%, but it's higher than the, most, the oldest group uh, of over 50s, who um, a very small percentage of those, I think about 23%, had been mobile. So we can see from that that the mid-career scientists are more mobile than the younger career scientists, but they're very close, and uh, it, there seems to be a generational shift towards more international mobility. If we ask those that haven't been mobile and those that have been mobile, what do they think? Do they think there's a negative impact of lack of mobility opportunities on their career? Then we find that uh, the younger scientists are the most the most, they, they, they tend the most to say that um, at least to some extent there's a negative effect of a lack of mobility. So three quarters of them are very aware of how import, uh, important um, uh, mobility is and they, are, they feel that a lack of it has a real impact on their careers. Over to international collaboration. What are the barriers to international collaboration? Because the, the, the call for action also highlights um, international collaboration between countries, and especially between developing and developed countries, and equitable collaboration. And it's also something that's coming into the research ethics and integrity space as well. Those of you who might be working in that we are, are aware of the fact that there are increasingly calls for more equitable collaboration between developed and developing countries. Well, the young scientists mentioned the inability to find partners, number one, for international collaboration. They don't know where to even start looking. Um, lack of resources um, caused them to stay at home and not go to international conferences and therefore not link up with people that they potentially could collaborate with. It's kind of a catch-22 situation. They want to collaborate so that they can also get access via the collaborations to some international funding. But in order to just get going on this endeavor, they need um, some basic resources as well. There are language barriers, I must say. I've just arrived from South Africa, and uh, my French is very, not even rudimentary. It's below rudimentary, and it can be quite, um, quite an issue for some African scientists also to overcome the language barriers. And institutional barriers include 
lack of, of leave. Um, teaching is just such a large part of a lot of universities and undergraduate teaching is a lower focus on research that going to a conference is just not possible. You just don't get the leave for that. Um, and then much more closely related to the call for action are the negative experiences that were reported in the interviews. Not that there were not positive ones, but I just wanted to highlight these because they dovetail with the call for action. So international, in international collaborations, local institutions are often um, perceived as the weaker partner. And um, the, the African scientists feel that they don't have the locus of control. They don't um, have decision-making power within the collaborations. Also, this is a function, obviously, of their age as well. And there were reports of unequal distribution of workload um, between developing and developed countries with the African um, scientists doing most of the work and the international partners getting most of the, um, of the credit. Again, these are perceptions that were conveyed during um, interviews. Over to recommendations then. Research funding. Um, I would say from our results that dedicated funds for early career scientists is quite important. They cannot compete with the older counterparts. They need, um, or there needs to be a differentiated funding structure so that one can take into account the lower level of experience, the lower levels of qualifications in some cases, not even a PhD, of these African scientists. At least some seed funding to get them, um, to give them that foot in the door in the um, funding regimes of the world or even in their own countries. So that I would think would be very important and such funds should also focus, as we saw, on research equipment. You might not have seen in that one slide that library and information technology, etc., does not seem to be a huge issue compared with laboratory research equipment. So that would be a priority as well. Support in sourcing research funding. How do I write a research proposal that is high quality? How do I manage the language? Um, and also, yes, where do I even start looking for funding? Here, institutions and research offices at African institutions have become stronger but are still comparatively weak and not functioning as well in supporting their own researchers in the institutions. Funding agencies could also do quite a lot there in terms of um, how to uh, help researchers source funding. I know, though, that they are increasingly doing a lot. We get at Stellenbosch University, at least, which is an advantaged university on the African continent, if one can state it like that. We get quite a lot of um, invitations from international funding organizations to come to um, training sessions and information sessions. So uh, I think the need has been recognized by at least the larger um, funding organizations internationally. Mentoring and training. Yes, what is needed is more detailed constructive feedback. If a grant proposal is uh, unsuccessful, or from editors and even reviewers, if a paper is rejected. There are a lot of theories that become almost constructed realities for these researchers on why they get rejected, um, including it's just because they're from Africa. Um, and the editors don't understand the African context and the importance of their research. And I think there is a breakdown of communication there between editors and the young African scientists. And it's very important that there's a two-way conversation here. I know editors of journals are very, very busy, but this kind of developmental work could be done also by local journals. Our own South African Journal of Science has these writing retreats, writing workshops um, that's funded by the Academy of Sciences of South Africa. That is very, very popular and really helpful. So that's an idea. Um, do not leave the searching for a mentor to the mentees. 
you know, the young scientists should not be expected to go and look around inside their departments for someone that um, could mentor them. So more formal mentoring programs would be very, very helpful so that um, one can also formalize the content of these, which, as I said, um, should possibly focus on publication. Again, the, the issue of predatory publications, um, predatory journals that are taking advantage of young African scientists that do not know about these journals. Um, that's a huge problem that we have right now at the moment, and uh, we're doing research on it, uh, and uh, I could share that with anyone who wants to discuss it during tea. Mobility. There were calls for more information. Please give us information about mobility opportunities. Give us information on the funding that is available to go from country A to country B and stay there. But there's always a, a, a note of caution that comes with us. We saw a huge brain drain three, generation, oh, three decades ago from African universities. It's now slightly reversed. There is some brain gain again. But we, we have to be very careful that we don't leave the young African scientists by themselves um, in universities in Africa while the rest of the um, more experienced staff leave um, for, um, for other countries. And even the young ones, we really want the young scientists to come back to Africa. So brain gain is important when we do look at mobility. But people need to make their own decisions, and there's only that much that one can do with policy directives. Finally, and I have mentioned already, some institutional environments in Africa are not very conducive for research. The universities, um, the, the, the university management, top management, seems to not support research, so they are also a group of stakeholders that one could consider in trying to prioritize the uh, importance of research compared to, for instance, teaching at universities. HODs can make or break careers, heads of departments or chairs of departments. And uh, there are often um, problems there in terms of hierarchy. A lot of the young scientists mentioned that they just don't get encouragement. They get um, the opposite from, from their chairs and from their deans when they're asked to go on uh, sabbatical to go on study leave, or to go and use a mobility opportunity, and even to go to an international conference, uh, that leave is just not granted, and it stops at the, the head of the department. So one needs to take that into account as well. It's on a micro level, though, and the senior academic staff as well are not seen as empowering, and empowerment is the focus of that call for action. And it is on that note, then, that I conclude my presentation. Thank you.